Hello and welcome to seminar three of the CO2X Live online seminar. My name is Sam Perry, I'm a research fellow at University of Southampton and my role is leading the research into the development of selective and efficient electrochemical catalysts. In this section I'll be presenting a few of the highlights of the ongoing work at Southampton University where we are looking into modifications that we can make at the catalyst level that will enable us to advance the overall outputs of the CO2X side technologies. So I'd like to start with a very brief overview of how this work fits into the wider goals of the CO2X side project. So here we have a schematic reactor design. At the cathode on the left we have CO2 entering in the gas phase which then reacts at the catalyst to get ethylene in the outflow. At the other side on the anode we have water oxidation leading to hydrogen peroxide production. So we're able to generate these two important products within the same reactor. In this section we'll be focusing on the electrochemical reactions that occur at the electrode surface and how we can make modifications to our materials in order to increase the efficiency of the reaction and the overall production rate. Before we go into the details, it's important to highlight two key metrics that will come up a lot in this presentation. The first is the Faradaic efficiency. Now, this is a ratio of the charge spent producing the target product against the total charge spent in the reactor, including all possible side reactions and background processes. This is essentially a measure of selectivity, so we want this to be as close to 100% as possible. The second metric is the production rate, which is quite simply the amount of product that we can make over a given time. Ideally, this should be as large as possible. The issue that we tend to run into is that it's very difficult to design a system that makes both of these metrics large at the same time. And we'll see reasons for that when we dive into the details of our electrochemical reactions. So first we're going to focus in on the anodic reaction. So that's the oxidation of water to give hydrogen peroxide. The major challenge of this reaction is surrounding the selectivity. In this step, we're trying to perform a two electron oxidation reaction, as indicated here on the right. The challenge we have is that under these conditions, it's possible to further oxidize our hydrogen peroxide to give oxygen gas. In fact, the reaction to oxidize hydrogen peroxide to oxygen is actually energetically easier than that initial oxidation to give hydrogen peroxide from water. So any environment that is sufficiently oxidizing to make hydrogen peroxide is inherently sufficiently oxidizing to break it down as well. A further complication is that a lot of materials can skip these steps altogether and produce oxygen gas directly from water oxidation via a four electron reaction. When we are thinking about reaction selectivity, we want to design a material that favours this initial two electron water oxidation step while simultaneously disfavouring the further oxidation of hydrogen peroxide and also the direct four electron pathway as well. Now, if we dive into the literature to think about this, we can find a number of materials out there that show very promising selectivities. Now, these are usually metal oxides, such as those of titanium, tungsten, or tin. However, these values are almost always measured at very low reaction rates. Now, there is a trend in water oxidation to peroxide that almost any material you can think of can produce peroxide selectively, as long as the reaction rate is sufficiently slow. If we apply a potential that is not very positive, this gives us a low overpotential, and so there is not much energy in our system to drive that oxidation. As soon as we increase the effort potential, we start to create a more highly oxidizing environment, and that starts to favor that peroxide oxidation to oxygen gas, or starts to favor the direct four electron pathway instead. If we want to make peroxide production from water oxidation viable, we need to find a new material that is able to produce peroxide at a much higher production rate. To do this, we started by thinking about materials that have been good for producing hydrogen peroxide via electrochemical reduction reactions. Now, the electrochemistry of hydrogen peroxide is slightly unusual in that all of the steps shown on the right are reversible. This means that just as it's possible to make peroxide via a two electron water oxidation reaction, it's also possible to make it via a two electron reduction of oxygen gas. Now we know that carbon is naturally a pretty good material for hydrogen peroxide production from the electrochemical reduction of oxygen gas. 
Unfortunately, the traditional carbon paper or foam materials that we would use are very unstable under oxidizing conditions, so they're not suitable for water oxidation applications. So here we started to look for carbon-based alternative materials that could give the selectivity advantages of carbon without those stability issues. To achieve this, we began by looking into boron dope diamond, or BDD. Now this is a highly stable material that can handle very oxidizing conditions. It can also be produced via chemical sputtering techniques onto conductive substrates, so further down the line it would be fairly simple to integrate it into any final reactor design. Now water oxidation of BDD is relatively well known, however it had previously only really been employed in studies into electrochemical water treatment, so water being oxidised into highly reactive radicals that then go on to break down organic pollutants. We were interested to see if we could tune the BDD operating conditions to produce hydrogen peroxide instead, and if so, how does the selectivity and reaction rate compare to these other leading materials? Now all of the work done in this section on the material development was done by this guy we can see on the right, Satiri, who is a PhD student in our group. So looking into the peroxide production of BDD, we have two plots being shown. The plot on the left shows our production rate in micromoles per minute per square centimetre of the electrode, and the plot on the right is showing our Faraday efficiency that was recorded at those same potentials. We can see that as the potential is being increased, we get an increase in the amount of peroxide being produced at that electrode. For the Faraday efficiency, uh, the value is increasing up to a fairly oxidising potential, but then as the potential gets more positive, the efficiency starts to decrease. So it's pretty clear that the efficiency of BDD as a catalyst ranks very differently depending on which plot we're looking at. And actually this becomes much more clear when we make comparisons to the other leading materials in the literature. Focusing on the reaction rate, BDD outperforms all of these leading metal oxide catalysts by quite a long way. For the Faraday efficiency, BDD performs relatively poorly, with a maximum of around 28% that is beaten by almost all of the metal oxides. The question that we have to ask here is, is it acceptable to have such a high rate of production at the expense of a poorer Faraday efficiency? Now this is where the electrochemical route to peroxide gives us a distinct advantage. Energetically speaking, it's not ideal to be wasting this much of our charge on background processes. However, that wasted charge is primarily only producing oxygen gas. This means that our reactor outflow will still only contain a pure solution of hydrogen peroxide. Although we are wasting energy, the poor selectivity will not give us any product separation costs, so it is still feasible for us to be using our BDD material. So next we can have a look at the developments in the carbon dioxide reduction side of the project. Now carbon dioxide reduction is pretty unique in that there is a massive number of different species that can be formed during our experiments. Now the first job for any electrochemical system is therefore to take steps to try and target just one of these possible species. As a first step, some simple metal catalysts already show a fair level of selectivity towards one product. Uh, gold and silver favour carbon monoxide, whereas lead or tin uh, tend to make formic acid, for example. Now copper is pretty unique, and that is it's able to make multiple products in relatively high concentrations at the same time. It is also the only material able to make two carbon species like ethylene in substantial amounts. However, the selectivity is still far from 100%. Now, on the right here I've shown a fairly simplified uh, carbon dioxide reduction mechanism showing the routes to get formate, carbon monoxide, methane, methanol, ethylene and ethanol. Don't worry too much about the individual steps, but I think it's worth highlighting that the pathways to all of these different species involve a number of shared intermediates, which makes it very difficult to separate the pathways. Another factor that's worth highlighting is that the root ethylene has to pass through a surface absorbed carbon monoxide molecule. Now it's possible that this carbon monoxide could be released, and that's the route to giving carbon monoxide as the end product. So convincing carbon monoxide to stick around at the electrode surface so it's further reduced all the way to ethylene, is a common theme in trying to increase that ethylene selectivity. A further challenge that we have with carbon dioxide reduction is that we, uh, the potentials that we apply for carbon dioxide reduction are also negative enough to reduce water to give hydrogen gas. So in our gas outflow, we'd expect to have a mixture of ethylene along with methane, carbon monoxide, and also hydrogen as byproducts. 
What we need to do now is to make some modifications that can enhance the rate of ethylene formation while slowing down the rate of methane, carbon monoxide and hydrogen production. Now there are two main routes to achieving this. One is to focus on surface changes that favour ethylene over the other possible carbon dioxide reduction products. The second route is to focus on hindering water reduction so that less of our past charge is wasted on the production of hydrogen. Now we can get a fairly promising rate of ethylene production by attaching our copper catalyst to a gas diffusion electrode, or GDE. Here you can see we have copper nanoparticles which give us a nice large surface area. The carbon dioxide flows through the back of our gas diffusion electrode through a porous carbon layer and then arrives at the catalyst where it reacts to form ethylene. Now this type of electrode gives us a very rapid supply of carbon dioxide to the catalyst which helps to make sure that most of the charge is used to reduce CO2 rather than reduce water. Uh, GDEs also contain hydrophobic components which help to stop water entering that porous structure. Now this has two benefits as it lowers the rate of water reduction and also stops the electrolytes from getting in behind the GDE and blocking our gas flow channels. Now if we use this type of electrode along with a very basic electrolyte, the combination gives us a good start towards lowering that rate of hydrogen production. Our next modification is focusing on pushing carbon dioxide reduction right the way through to give ethylene. Now we've achieved this using polymers with intrinsic microporosity, or PIMS for short. These are a new type of material that have been developed by the McKeon Group over at University of Edinburgh. The great thing about these is that they spontaneously self-assemble to give a highly porous structure, where these pores are so small that they actually stop bubbles from forming. Now this can trap gases close to the electrode structure in higher concentrations than would normally be possible. Recent works have shown that these PIMs are able to improve the activity of oxygen reduction catalysts for fuel cells. So our idea was to see if this same idea could be used to enhance the carbon dioxide reduction reaction at copper catalysts. We also hope there could be an added bonus that any carbon monoxide released could become trapped too, and that's going to favour the further reduction to go all the way down to our ethylene end product. We can see the impact of the PIMS layer on the voltammetry right away where the added PIMS layer in the red is shifting our carbon dioxide reduction wave to lower over potentials versus the bare electrode shown in the white. This is a promising start, but at the moment we're only looking at the general behaviour of carbon dioxide reduction at our electrode. What we really want to know is does this affect the amount of ethylene we're getting with respect to the other possible carbon dioxide reduction products. So if we replot our data now in terms of the Faraday efficiency, we can see that we do indeed get a pretty sizable increase in the ethylene selectivity when we compare the pin coat electrode in the red to the bare electrode in the white. We can see the same trend in the information by comparing our TAFL slopes. And if you're not familiar with this type of analysis, the more shallow the gradient we see, the more active the electrode is towards the specific reaction. So you can see here that our PIMS coated electrode is significantly more active than the bare one. Now importantly, because we're looking at the ethylene current here rather than the total current of the electrode surface, this means that the electrode is specifically more active for carbon dioxide reduction to ethylene as our end product. Now this situation becomes more complicated if we start to change the PIMS loading at our catalyst surface. Now ideally a thicker PIM coating should trap more carbon dioxide at our electrode and so we should see an even better reaction. However what we see is actually much more complicated. The thin PIMS more coating is much better than the bare one as we saw on the previous slide. But as the coating is made progressively thicker in the, the green and the blue traces we can see that the performance gets progressively worse. We can also see the same trend if we look at our Faraday efficiencies. And again we can see that same trend when we compare our TAFL slopes as well. So clearly the relationship is a lot more complicated than we realised. It turns out that the PIMS coating has a secondary effect on the hydrophobicity of our electrode surface. Now remember when we looked at the gas diffusion electrodes in general, we need that surface to be hydrophobic to slow the rate of hydrogen evolution and also to stop liquid electrolytes from getting into the gas flow channels. Now here we use contact angle measurements carried out by Dr. Sam Gateman over at McGill University to see how the hydrophobic surface is with varying amounts of PIMS at the electrode. 
what we see is that as the pin's thickness increases, we get a progressive decrease in the hydrophobicity of that surface. Now this explains why the thick coating performs worse than the thinner coating, because the hydrophobicity loss is countering the benefits that we got from that porous layer. We also see an interesting impact of the PIMS on the stability of the hydrophobic surface. So the starting hydrophobicity is shown in the white, and the hydrophobicity of that same electrode after a six hour reduction reaction is shown in the red. We can see as before that the presence of the PIMS layer is reducing that starting hydrophobicity, which is a bad thing. But the PIMS is also making the electrode surface more stable to changes in the hydrophobicity, which is a good thing. Now this is highlighting that we need to be really careful to select a compromise loading if we want to employ these PIMS in order to get the best possible performance out of our electrodes. So as a brief conclusion, uh, we've looked at the different materials and catalyst surface modifications to increase the selectivity and reaction rate for water oxidation to peroxide and for carbon dioxide reduction to ethylene. For hydrogen peroxide, BDD electrodes give an excellent production rate, although this does come at a cost to the selectivity, but the benefits outweigh the costs here, particularly when we're thinking about upscaling. For carbon dioxide reduction, we've improved the selectivity of copper gas diffusion electrodes using this porous PIMS layer, although we do have to be careful with the compromise loading in order to gain the benefits of this porous layer without having significant costs to the hydrophobicity. If you're interested in reading more about these or similar works, I've included a few references here. Um, a couple of reviews that we've published in the, sub the subjects recently. Uh, also, Satiri's paper into the BDD catalyst published in ACS Supplied Energy Materials, and our paper on the PIMS coated electrodes, which we published in Chemosphere. Uh, that's about all I have to cover here. Just enough time to say thank you to our collaborators in making this work possible, um, especially to Satiri for the work on the BDD electrodes, uh, Sam Gateman, formerly at McGill, for the contact angle hydrophobicity measurements, and Neil McKeon for developing and supplying the PIMS. And of course, thank you all for attending this year to Excel online seminar. If you would like to find out more, please do check out these publications or feel free to get in touch if you do have any questions.